I've got Good morning. Um, I'm sorry I'm a few minutes late. I am trying to get election law things taken care of for the calendar, along with every other committee chair in this building. Welcome to the New Hampshire House Special Committee on Redistricting. We haven't met in a while. We are here on Thursday the 14th um, at 10 o'clock to consider bills relating to the Senate and Executive Council districts, which we have received from the Senate. Senator Gray is with us, but before we begin, I ask that you all rise and join me in a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, and thank you, Senator Gray. Welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is James Gray. I represent uh, Senate District 6, which uh, starts in Rochester, goes up Route 11 into Belknap County, Alton, Barnstead, Gilmanson. Uh, what you see in front of you, uh, and it's uh, easier described on the, the map that uh, you have provided for the people here, 
um, is the Senate uh, redistricting plan. Um, of note, uh, things that happened is that uh, with the shift of population, uh, the northern part of the state uh, decreasing population and the southern portion of the state increasing population and that population increase more prevalent on the eastern side of the southern part of the state. Uh, it did require uh, some uh, significant changes in the districts uh, to reach um, that equal population that our Constitution talks about and the federal law talks about. Uh, one of those uh, things that uh, uh, we looked at f uh, right off the bat, I think I mentioned it in one of the uh, special committee hearings of uh, the joint committees between the House and the Senate, was that uh, Manchester uh, had the, almost the perfect population for having just two Senate districts, uh, and that Nashua, uh, their population, if they remained in the number of wards that they had, and those wards were distributed out with equal population, uh, made it very difficult to maintain the system as it is. Uh, one of the uh, groups that uh, represented, uh, they uh, put forth a, uh, and the idea that we could uh, have a population deviation in Nashua between uh, that and the ideal population of 8% uh, or very close to that, uh, which uh, certainly did not please me much. Uh, but uh, uh, again, that's what Nashua did, and they enacted it. So uh, the Nashua wards uh, were broken down in the Senate districts along those uh, populations. Uh, I uh, certainly uh, I think that the, they could have done better for the population or for the people in uh, New Hampshire uh, than they did. Uh, certainly people have asked me, what was the criteria? How did you de make this decision? How did you make that decision? And I'll tell you that <clears throat> the criteria, uh, certainly we looked Thank at you. a whole bunch of things, uh, but that when you're trying to do uh, an equal population uh, deviation between the various census districts, uh, and you have that as your, your one of your highest principles um, that uh, it answers some of those questions. Once uh, you get below that and you say, well, I have a choice between this community, that community, looking at population of how you group them together, looking at uh, communities of interest types, including the uh, form of government that they have chosen, you know, SB2 towns, uh, traditional uh, towns, uh, with traditional town meetings, uh, the cities, the um, the school districts, as the uh, the mapping people had suggested, we we looked at some of that. Uh, we looked at a lot of different things, and because each one of those communities are different, uh, it was different each time we drew a map. And there were a lot of maps that actually got drawn, uh, but for various reasons were never publicized, were never put out. Uh, certainly we took in consideration the, the testimony of the various people in the towns uh, when, you know, from the public hearings. And I did attend all 10 of those uh, public hearings. Um, I may be the only one on both the House and the Senate that actually made it to all 10. Uh, it was a little difficult uh, uh, up in, uh, when we were up in um, uh, Conway, I think it was, uh, the uh, construction up there on the roads caused a little delay, and uh, but uh, we did make it to all of them. Uh, I'm here for a minute, and then I'm going to be across the street, so if you have anything, uh, ask me now, and I'll be back at 1030 or whenever is appropriate for the, for the next hearing. Representative Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator, for taking my question. Um, as you know, I am from Cheshire County, and I have a concern because I wonder uh, what the rationale was for putting Cheshire County into four different senatorial districts. Well, again, as I said, that one of the highest priorities that we had was getting that population equal, and then as we were able to make that different population, in fact... Um, 
I, I, the, the name of the town escapes me. One of the last things I did, we well, see where uh, the interface between uh, Senate District 8 and Senate District uh, 10, that uh -huh. little elbow-shaped uh, yep. town there, uh, that's one of the last things that I did before I sent the map forward, and that actually reduced my my population deviation uh, by you know several tenths of a percent. Uh, so again, uh, you know it. People have said, well, gee, the maps are jaggedy and this and that. But if you really are trying to get that population correct, in my opinion, uh, in accordance with um, part one, Article Nine of the Constitution, which does talk about representative districts, but has been applied to all of the the redistricting we do. Um, we worked hard to get that population um, to a number that uh, that we could support. Follow up, Madam Chair. Follow up. And of particular concern to me um, is Senate District Nine, which you said you you. Uh, were concerned with communities of interest. Um, I note that Senate District 9 runs from Hinsdale on the Connecticut River, uh, which is a small uh, town, and all the way over to Bedford, which is a very different large town on the other, you know, more than halfway across the state. And um, I wonder why having been intimately involved in doing senatorial maps 10 years ago, it's much easier than doing house maps because the deviations are much easier to satisfy. And I, this, this town appears to me to be the very essence of gerrymandering. So was there no other possible way to have kept communities of interest together? There are thousands of ways to keep communities of interest together and thousands of ways to look at this map. That the testimony that we heard in Sullivan County was, gee, we have a very close association with the people in Vermont. We share services, we share schools, we share a lot of things across that border. The people that we heard down in the southern part of the state said, well, our economy is very much in tune with the people in Massachusetts. And so that once you go and look at those populations that if I'm not saying community of interest is the highest thing on my list, but population is, and then I look at those, the input that we got from the various communities about who they did want to be associated with, and even though we may try to do something, I'll tell you, I could tear any map that anybody put apart and cast aspersions on it and say it's gerrymandered and say it's this map. The population deviation is, I believe, 7.5%. A lot of that population deviation is due to the things that were done by the Nashua community in the way that they redistricted and are not, you really can't change them if you're going to do the five or six different uh, wards in Nashua to put them together. Uh, you just can't do it. So there's, if we want to sit, <clears throat> sit and take pot shots at any particular map, you draw a map, you let me take pot shots, I can do the same thing. Questions from other members of the committee? Representative Wilhelm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator, for joining us and for taking my question. Uh, I'm curious, I represent Manchester Wards 1, 2, and 3. Um, curious why uh, Ward 1 is separated from the, the rest of the city. Well, one of the criteria that was used many, many years ago uh, when uh, I was probably younger than you uh, was to uh, group uh, communities together such that you had uh, one or more sitting senators, representatives, whatever districts that you were using against each other, okay? And so we look at Manchester and we look at uh, like Goffstown and other communities and that if you take a, a, a larger portion of Manchester 
and put it up against one of those other communities, they have an undue influence, in my opinion, uh, on who's going to get elected in that. So the original intent was to take and make Manchester just two Senate districts, uh, but that would have put uh, two of the senators uh, competing against each other since there are currently uh, three Democratic senators that live in Manchester. Uh, I did not, in any other place on that map, I did not put uh, two sitting senators uh, in opposition with each other unless the senators had expressed to me uh, that they uh, were looking at a change. Uh, point in fact is uh, uh, District 2. Uh, the senator from District 2 said that um, he was looking at uh, moving further uh, south and east in his district uh, so that uh, that allowed us to take District 1 and come down into the area of the state where he currently lives. Uh, but again, that was one of the things that we did not want to do, uh, unlike some of the other maps that, uh, that were out there uh, that have been proposed by various groups, uh, that uh, one of them I saw had, had three sitting senators um, sitting you know, in the same district. So you know, what are you going to get? You're going to, are we going to call that gerrymandering or not? Well, again, that's one of the things that I tried to avoid in making these maps. Further questions from committee members? Representative <clears throat> Lane. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, Senator, are you saying that you took incumbents into account over other criteria? Absolutely. Follow up, Madam Chair? Certainly. Um, <clears throat> can you comment on why that is not seem to be a problem in the congressional maps that have been drawn? And recommended by the governor? There is uh, differences in the eligibility for state offices where you have to live in your district and federal offices for especially congressional districts, uh, but we're not here to talk about the congressional districts, but you do not need to actually live in a congressional district to run in that district. Uh, case in point uh, was uh, Mr. Sanders who ran uh, two years ago uh, in uh, a district that he did not live in. Further questions from committee members? Seeing none, um, I'm going to open the floor to comment on SB 240. Um, Senator Gray has other things to do. Senator Gray, if you can stay here until 1030, um, the people who have signed up to speak on 240 have also signed up to speak on 241. So my preference would be to start to take public testimony now for 10 minutes. And if you can stay, then break in the public testimony, go into your second bill before us at 241 as noticed. And then after you present that bill, we can let you take care of the rest of your day and we can continue to hear testimony on both bills. Then. As you wish. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Senator Gray, for introducing 240. Um, also signed up, signed up to speak on 240 is Olivia Zink. And um, Ms. Zink, I'll leave it to you as to whether or not you want to just address 240 or, or both of them at this point. Excuse me, Madam Chair. She cannot address the other uh, the one. Other we one have not, not arrived the at the time I didn't yet. officially open it. So <laughs> let's thank you, Representative Weber. Okay, so testimony for 240. Correct. Um, my name is Olivia Zing, the Executive Director for Open Democracy Action. We're a nonpartisan nonprofit organization which has 35,000 members here in New Hampshire, and we work on democracy. And I live in Franklin. And I'm a mother of a 12 year old daughter. And my 12 year old daughter will be voting in six years. And these maps will be the things that she, she gets to inherit as a first time voter. Um, so the, the, you know, just a reminder that these maps are for 10 years. Um, I, I thank you for the opportunity to, to oppose Senate Bill 240. Um, I think that this bill doesn't take into consideration what's best for the majority of voters in New Hampshire, which are the undeclared voters. And public criteria um, is very important. Um, these maps have sprawling districts, which are not compact. This increases the margin to win. Republicans 
can win 15, almost 16 of these Senate districts um, are lean Republican, which locks in a super majority um, for Republicans. This ignores uh, communities of interest like regional high schools and splits 35 high school SAUs. This packs districts with voters, um, both in the minority and majority parties. It puts college towns like Lebanon and Hanover and Plymouth into Senate District 5, leaving those adjacent districts more conservative. Um, it has a somewhat high deviation um, and I think most of this is actually contributed to the Nashua ward lines, splitting Manchester into three districts where it could be e evenly split into two districts. There are only three competitive um, Senate district and zero very competitive district. I want to speak to the Senate district that I live in. Um, it puts the city of Franklin in a district that goes to Orange, which is uh, in the Upper Valley. Most of the people in Orange go shopping in Lebanon. And it goes down to Hillsboro. And so I would say that most of the triangle that represents Franklin, Orange, and Hillsboro don't have a lot in common. Um, and you also can't get there from one town to another unless you like hike over Mount Cardigan. Um, which is one way to get to Orange, uh, but the roads don't really take you there. Um, and then I wanted to speak to Senate District 9, um, which is a lean Republican um, district, which stretches now from the Vermont border to Hinsdale all the way to Bedford. And it's one town deep. Um, and I just want to point out that I don't think Hinsdale and Bedford have a lot in common as far as communities of interest. Um, I really want to urge this committee to work towards a solution that works for both parties, um, that if 50% of the voters vote Republican and 50% of the voters vote Democrat, um, that we could get a map that works for both parties instead of one party getting 16 seats and the other party getting eight seats. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take questions. And I have copies of my written testimony that I can hand around. Great, thank you. If you can just pass, why don't you just give that to Representative Roulard and we'll get it passed around. Questions from committee members? Uh, Representative Lane. Thank you. Um, I, did you uh, pr pr propose a Senate map, Open Democracy, to the Senate in the same way that you did to us here in the House? Yes, the Mapathon team has proposed maps. Um, David Andrews, who's our lead mapper, is here today and can speak to the Mapathon proposals, and we'll have copies of all of that analysis for you as well. I have a Further, um, is the deviation um, significantly greater in the Open Democracy map than it was in why don't, the? Well, Mr. Andrews has signed up to speak. Why don't oh, we? Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll wait. I'll pepper him. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, he's much better at answering deviation questions than I am. Much better at the math. All right. Further questions? Representative McGee. And thank welcome you, back to election. Thank you. Thank you so or much. And I don't even know what committee I'm in anymore. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chairman. And thank you for taking my question. Uh, you've testified, uh, given some examples around uh, how community of interests uh, concerns are, have not been adequately addressed in some of the sections. I wonder if you could say anything about the um, the overall fairness in difference to other maps that have been presented to the committee for consideration um, for the voters. You did allude to um, how independent voters might be um, not served as well by this map. Could you say a little more about that so we can understand it? Um, yeah, well, I'll try to attack that question. I think New Hampshire is a very purple state um, where the majority of voters are undeclared voters. And we know undeclared voters can swing ele elections. And um, when you do analysis of maps, you can look at different years of elections based on you know, what, what swings different voters. And so um, I think the district you're in has swung, has been mostly Republican for the last 10 years, but has swing, swung Democrat at least once in the Senate district. 
And I believe that Senate district is very similar um, this decade, this proposal decade, as it was the, the prior decade. Um, and I think that when we look at maps, we really want to make sure voters say, I'm going to the polls because I feel like my vote matters. Not, I'm, doesn't matter which candidate I choose for Senate because there's already a preordained outcome. And it's really important that there's faith and integrity in the process. And I believe that in some of these Senate districts, some voters might look at the map and say, I don't believe my vote matters. Whether I'm a Republican in Lebanon, and I'd say, it doesn't matter who I vote for as a Republican in Lebanon, because the Republican candidate in Lebanon has no chance of winning that district with New London and and Plymouth and Lebanon and, and Dartmouth's packed into that district whereas a district uh somebody a democratic voter in a different district might feel like their vote for a senate candidate might not matter follow up it's it's the question of a novice since i did not serve on the redistricting mm -hmm. committee but my question is whether or not the um the calculus of uh competitiveness is even one of the criterion that's used my understanding is there's been no criteria that's been publicly released. And I do think that next decade, it would be really helpful to have public criteria released on how the, these maps are drawn. Senator Gray talked about some of the criteria he used as far as protecting incumbents is one of those criteria. But I think um, I did not see a list of public criteria. Representative Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for being here today and taking my question. Uh, would you agree with me that uh, my constituents in Hinsdale, which is the farthest town to the southwest in our state, might be considerably aggrieved at a district which joins them to a very large population center, which is almost in Nashua, and that they might feel that no matter who wins this district, although we know who's going to win this district, um, that they might not be well served by a senator who is not as they are now from Cheshire County, but from somewhere all the way over near Nashua, which is where the population is. Uh, yes, I do agree that voters in Hinsdale might feel that a senator would not rep I would hope that a senator would feel like they represent every town in their district um, but I could see that it easily that a senator could focus their attention on those Bedford towns um, and not make it all the way across the state I think that it's also the roads don't go exact like 101 does not travel exactly that route to get from Hinsdale <laughs> it's a little tricky further questions from committee members that question was pretty speculative. I allowed it, but um, I'm going to ask committee members to try to ask questions that people would actually have a basis for responding. Any further questions? Thank you. Um, it is it is now 10:30. I'm going to um, put the public hearing on 2:40 into recess, and I'm going to recognize Senator Gray to introduce 2:41 to the committee. Welcome. Senator Gray. Thank you very much. Uh, for the record, I am James Gray. I represent Senate District 6, which starts in Rochester, goes up Route 11 into uh, Belknap County, uh, all from Barnstead and Gilmanton. Uh, certainly, one of the things that we heard from the public hearings was how gerrymandered, and I'll use quotes around that, of uh, the executive council districts were. Um, again, if you are really trying to do what the law says and get the populations as equal as possible, sometimes the maps get messy. Sometimes you end up with things that stretch out. So one of the things that we did try to do is to take a good look at that. The population deviation, I believe, for the map without any changes using the new census data was approximately 2.7. Um, we looked at uh, 
several different maps, uh, how that could be uh, accomplished. Um, and again, uh, not trying to protect any incumbent, but to make sure that we didn't intentionally have two incumbents running against each other, uh, which is one of the criteria in your NCLS book that you, I think, all got on election. You go into the chart on the back in the various states that have criteria for redistricting is one of the ones that's listed there. It's not gerrymandering. It's what I consider to be the opposite of gerrymandering. It is making sure that Someone doesn't decide, well, you know, this one and this one, we're going we're to have these two Democrats run off against each other. Uh, that's certainly not, not the intent of what I did, and it is uh, the opposite. We tried to make sure that that didn't happen, um, but sometimes things get messy. So the resulting map that you sit in front, uh, see in front of you, um, there was a lot of people that uh, wanted this, wanted that, wanted the other things. Um, I need to be able to count to 13 in the Senate uh, to get things passed, and uh, it took a long time. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the uh, map that you see in front of you was not uh, uh, put together in time to have a separate public hearing uh, in the Senate, uh, but it does a lot of the things that we were told in both the hearings that we held across the state in each one of the counties and what we heard in the other public hearings that was held on the map uh, that uh, is currently uh, invoked on those communities. Uh, this shifts uh, some of the population down into the area where uh, the uh, line of population, um, as a Representative uh, said, you know, a single line going across, uh, which, in fact, doesn't make it bad. It just says that's the way it is. And uh, so it shifts part of that population from, uh, from District 1 down into that area and then does what the people up in Sullivan County set up to do is that uh, they felt that they had an association with Vermont in keeping them together uh, and uh, an association with Vermont uh, that was uh, beneficial to them. Uh, we tried to not do uh, very much in uh, districts uh, three and four uh, to keep them relatively the same. Uh, and five, again, due to those population, uh, not any other nefarious thing, uh, but uh, uh, due to population trying to get uh, those maps very close. And in fact, the population was, uh, uh, I guess it's not quite half, it's uh, closer to half of, of what the deviation would have been at 2.7. I think it's one something. I, 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 the number escapes me right now. Uh, but uh, remember that the thing that's in law, you know, you go back and, and populations as equal as possible, practical, you can go look the word up. Uh, in the Constitution, uh, these people that talk about uh, compactness, these people that talk about other things, um, just show it to me in the law, and I probably would have done different things. Uh, but uh, that's not in law. Uh, law is population, population, population. And if you look at the Supreme Court decision, uh, Manchester v. Gardner, uh, and you look at it, uh, certainly it's clear in there. Um, and we certainly did uh, use that as a reference in uh, the things that we did with the various maps. Thank you. Questions? Representative Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, would you agree with me as a matter of first principles that an affinity with Vermont for the river towns has nothing to do with redistricting because there are still going to be river towns and Vermont is still going to stay where it is? I will not agree with you. What I, my testimony was is that at the hearings in Sullivan County, that was a request. Now, a valid request, I guess you can take that up with the people at the hearing that uh, made that request. But uh, we did listen to them, and we do know that there are 
many of things that do happen across the border and across the river. And uh, in fact, uh, a lot of times people uh, cross the border to go down the, the, the road so that they can come back into Hampshire. And that's actually, you know, quicker for them than uh, traveling just the roads in Hampshire. So there is an association, be, whether you like it or not, it, it was expressed in the hearings. Follow up. Okay, I'll leave that one. Um, this next question is not, a, not speculative because it's a matter of population and the way the lines were drawn. So, isn't it true that as the maps are currently drawn, with the population being very much in the south of both District 2 and District 1, that it is conceivable that the North Country will wind up with no effective representation whatsoever under this map? Could you please define effective representation? Uh, isn't it true that you may have one counselor from uh, Concord and one counselor from over in the very farthest southeast corner, both of whom are from larger metropolitan areas which have look very unlike most of the North Country as it is now constituted. I think the committee can stipulate that rural communities are different than metropolitan areas. Senator Gray, do you want to answer that question or not? I certainly, you know, by looking at this map, uh, I can draw a very small circle um, that, uh, you know, would encompass part of uh, one, part of two, part of four and part of five uh, or any other combination of four of those in, in you know cover it with a probably a 50 cent piece the way this map is, is is printed so is it possible yeah but who's making the choice the voters in the state of new hampshire are making the choice and to say that a population deviation of under two is not preferable to a population deviation of three or four is ridiculous. And one final, Matt. One final follow-up. My final follow-up is the observation that isn't it true that because we are only dealing with five districts and many, many, many towns, there are any number of ways that you could have put this together, unlike the house maps where it's very difficult where you would have achieved the same population or better and probably not better. It's pretty good for deviation and not um, confuse the communities of interest to the extent that this map does. You, you had me, Representative Weber, until you said confused communities of interest. Could you rephrase that? Uh, Madam Chair, if, if it's possible. If you want to go ahead and answer it, go I, ahead. Briefly, please, Senator. I will stipulate that there are probably millions of ways to do this map. My job, and again, I look for the, the Supreme Court decision, Manchester v. Gardner, about what they did when they were looking at the various maps and saying, okay, where do I start? Where do, where do I go? Okay? And decisions get made. A decision in Manchester and a decision in Nashua can make a big impact on other portions of this map. And when you're looking at population, Further we, took question. In, we took into consideration the, the wants and, that we could from the various hearings that we held. We did our best. This is the map in front of you. It is not the 99,999 other ones that could be drawn. My point exactly. Further questions from the committee? Representative Wilhelm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator, thanks for taking my question. Um, it's my understanding that uh, this bill came out of the election law committee in the Senate uh, with the districts, the current districts, still intact. Um, and then there was a floor amendment, uh, which is what we're reviewing today. What prompted the floor amendment? What, 
why why a floor amendment after the districts that were you know put through the election law committee there was consensus at that time what 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 happened between the committee meeting and the time the bill hit the floor of the senate i can tell you that uh, if you go back through the hearings and various uh, uh things that uh, that happened in the committee uh that there are there were people uh and the testimony both in the senate hearings and the hearings across the state uh, that something be done with district two uh, but again as i mentioned before uh, you need to count to 13 to be able to pass anything in the senate uh, so we continue to work on that we continue to try to improve it we tr continue to try to get that population down further than the 2.7 uh, that population that was in the map that uh, was voted out of the committee um, and we were able to achieve that, and uh, then that uh, prompted a floor amendment because of procedure. Further questions from committee members? Representative McGee. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Senator, for taking my question. Um, my question relates to the Fair Maps effort. I, I attended uh, my county's uh, redistricting meeting, and I also... Um, know the person in my town who presented a warrant article at our last town meeting which passed and I understand there's about 74 towns passed warrant articles asking for fair maps and I understand that the word fair is in the eye of the beholder perhaps but I believe that the mapathon effort worked to try and supply maps that were fair in that they were um, not designed to help any party but rather to advantage the voter and I wonder if you could speak to the the map that you've given here as to how how it how it stands up against the other maps that were presented i know you've said you could do it a million different ways it's true um there are many ways to slice up a map but i think we i think the committee was presented with maps that were um more fair than this map that we're looking at right now and i, I wish you could speak to that I don't know what more fair means. I know what what legal means. I know what the Constitution says about equal population. I know that many of the maps that were presented from the fair map people had errors in them that I pointed out to them. Uh, one of the maps had a town um, for this particular map, I believe, uh, that was uh, misplaced in a district when we were looking at retaining the stuff. I know that they per, they wanted Nashua and proposed to Nashua uh, that they have a population deviation of eight, uh, approximately eight down in Nashua, which certainly, in my opinion, doesn't follow the state constitution in trying to get equal population as equal as you can. They have an agenda that said that uh, we need to keep school districts together. I will tell you that and I have been a representative, I have been a school board member, I have been a city councilman, and I have been a senator. And as I move up the chain, school districts become less a thing that, that I need to associate real closely with uh, as I go up. And so trying to take that school thing and say, I'm going to make a congressional map because I'm going to move this town because it keeps the school district together. Uh, it, it did not pass the common sense with, test with me. That when I was a school board member, absolutely. Okay? When I was a city councilman, yeah, I, I want to keep that in. But as I get to be a representative and more broad interpretation, and now as a senator, it's just not a practical criterion. Thank you, Senator. Further questions from committee members? Representative Weber. Are keeping counties together no longer a consideration for you? Because I noticed that these districts uh, have very little respect for county lines or the concerns of people on the county level, which is a much broader level than the school district. Two things I'd like to say about that. I represent two counties right now, Stafford County and Belknap County. I think that going to the various meetings that I do in both counties gives me a better perspective of what 
the general population across the two counties that I represent. I also want to point out that when Mapathon uh, started this uh, and they started to look at communities of interest, I was told by one of their representatives that their original list of communities of interest contained more than 60 items and that those were winnowed down to the ones that you see in the maps. So just as I could have another 10,000 you know, different maps, I can also have another combination of communities of interest that were at least something that they, can, they considered as communities of interest when they started to do the maps. Further questions from committee members? Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator, uh, I agree that defining a fair map is a difficult process. Would you agree that a fair map means that the district is as competitive as possible? No, and let me explain that, okay? If I go and stick a pin in Portsmouth and I try to make a map that's competitive uh, Portsmouth is, uh, leans very, very democratic. And if I try to make it competitive by going somewhere, and I'm not quite sure where, uh, to make it competitive, I have done a disservice to those people in Portsmouth. If I stick a pin in Belknap County, um, we'll say uh, up in uh, uh, Alton, for example, and I try to make that a competitive district, there's not a whole lot of things that you can do to make it a competitive district. And I have done a disservice. I believe that that is also in the definition of gerrymandering saying that I'm going to make this thing competitive no matter what the basis of the people are, no matter what the population is. And if you're going to expand your definition of gerrymandering the way uh, some of the representatives have have, have expressed opinions today, uh, then that would also fall into your definition of gerrymandering. Further questions from committee members? Madam Chair. Representative Bergeron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator, um, just a question. The existing population in the five council districts currently has a deviation of 2.27% without doing any changes at all. Did the Senate uh, take into consideration that they didn't need to redistrict at all? The Senate certainly did take that into consideration. The Senate and the hearing that was held in the Senate was a hearing on the map as unchanged. But there were people, probably some of the same people you'll hear from today, that still pointed to District 2 and said District 2 because it is one town long and stretches from the west side of the state to the east side of the state wanted to see a change. We were able to find a map that was presented in the floor amendment that you see in front of you that reduced that population deviation, further making us more compliant with the state constitution and producing a map that you see in front of you. Thank you, Senator. Further questions from committee members? Seeing none, thank you for being with us this morning, Senator Gray. It was a pleasure. All right, so at this point, I will reopen the hearing on 340, um, and we will also continue now with 241 in regards to the hearing on the bill we just heard, Executive Council Districts. Um, I'm going to recognize Olivia Zink because she was the only person who got to speak on 240. Um, I, I believe pretty much everybody that I've gotten a pink card has signed up to speak on both bills. Um, so I'm going to give everybody the opportunity to speak to both bills when they come up. And I'm going to ask that testimony be limited to five, um, six minutes because you're going to be testifying on two bills. And we'll let you know when you're at five minutes. Um, so um, thank you. Ms. Zink, and welcome back up again. And the paperwork will be passed around. And I think it got stopped somewhere the last time. So if we can just um, pass the written testimony out from people when we get it, um, that would be great. Thank you. 
Good morning, Representative Griffin and members of the Special Committee on Redistricting. For the record, my name is Olivia Zink, Executive Director for Open Democracy, um, a pro-voter, pro-voter, nonpartisan organization based in Concord, and I live in Franklin. Um, I want to first, before I start my testimony, just comment on um, Senator Gray's example of using Portsmouth to create a safe Republican district. He exactly did that in the executive council districts. So uh, it is possible to make Portsmouth a safe Republican district, and they have done that um, in that executive uh, council district. So, so executive council district one changes when uh, I think under undergoes the most amount of changes in this map, um, including Car uh, Claremont, Hanover, Lebanon, Littleton in Grafton County, also putting parts of Coos, Carroll, Belknap counties um, over into the other districts. District 2 um, also undergoes a lot of changes. I talk about them specifically in my testimony and, and since you have that in front of you, um, but I think it's really, it does lose a whole portion from the current executive council maps. So we are no longer a geographical executive council districts um, these maps have been um, reshaped. And I kind of think of that as a little bit of an E. You come from Littleton, you go into Concord, and then you go down to Peterborough, um, packing as many Democratic towns as they possibly could into that Executive Council District um, 2. Um, District 3 remains exactly the same as the as the other districts. Um, in my testimony, I do talk about um, what the governor has said on New Hampshire Public Radio in the exchange about the executive council maps. Um, and I think it's important that the whatever this body decides that uh, we don't get stuck in a place. Um, and also in my testimony, I do talk about this is the first time this this meeting right now is the first time the public has had a chance to give input on this proposal. Um, when the public hearing was in the Senate, there was a different Senate proposal for the executive council map. So this is the first time um, in the process that the public has been able to give input on this specific map. And I, again, think um, urge you to amend this map so that you're serving all voters. Um, and then you also have testimony from Joanne Emis and Hollis, Ian Burke in, in Keene, Ellen Farnham in Tamworth, and Catherine in Sunapee um, that I also handed out who could not be here today. Thank you. Um, I have a question I have written. Oh, they're stapled together. That's what's being passed out now. I held it because I didn't know what <laughs> I had. All right. So this is further. I think we might have gotten emails from... From some of them may, yes. may have emailed yeah. their testimony, but I know that there okay. may be a vote on this, so I wanted to make sure their testimony got in front of you. For um, today. No, for thank today. you. I appreciate it. Any questions for Ms. Zink? Seeing none, thank you very much. Also, also signed up to speak today on these bills, um, and on both bills is Linda Bundy. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Special Committee on Redistricting. I didn't bring printed copies, but I did email you yeah, my you testimony. Did. Um, when drawing redistricting, and this is with respect to SB 240, when drawing redistricting maps, population deviation limits are mandated by the state constitution. Citizens of New Hampshire attended public hearing sessions in each county and submitted additional criteria beyond the mathematics of population that they believed to be essential considerations when creating the maps. Most often cited were high school SAUs, shared emergency services, water and sewer systems, and public health facilities. 
While the maps in SB 240 do meet population deviation requirements, they fall short with respect to best practices in redistricting and applying the criteria requested by Granite Staters. The 2010 Senate map already reflected partisan advantage. In 2020, the election results were divided 50-50 between Republicans and Democrats, but the Senate seat split was 14 Republicans and 10 Democrats. The map proposed by SB 240 would have resulted in greater partisan advantage in the 2020 elections, yielding 15 Republican seats and nine Democratic. Some towns that lean Democratic have been packed into nine districts, while others have been split among the remaining 15 districts. In my region of the state, Hillsborough County towns of Hancock and Peterborough have been moved into District 10, making it more Democratic. At the same time, causing my own District 8 and also District 9 to lean more Republican. District 5 is packed with three Democratic college towns that are presently in separate districts. Compactness is a best practice that can keep communities of interest intact. The proposed map has a low compactness score when analyzed by DRA 2020 and splits 36 high school SAUs. Keeping SAUs intact was the single most important community of interest criterion requested by citizen input. District 9 is decidedly not compact, being one town wide from Hinsdale to Bedford across 90, 73 miles. Excuse me. I believe that the maps proposed by SB 240 are not in the best interest of the citizens of New Hampshire. I ask you to amend them. Thank you. And with respect to SB 241, the Executive Council maps of 2010 have served as a poster child for gerrymandering. The proposed maps in SB 241 look better, but in reality are more partisan. District 2 no longer stretches across the state from west to east. However, it does reach north to Littleton and Carroll, west to Concord and Peterborough, and south to Hinsdale and Winchester. District 2 leans more heavily Democratic, and District 1 is more Republican than before. Districts 3, 4, and 5 are somewhat competitive, but lean Republican. The voices of voters matter. A recent UNH poll indicates that 80% of voters do not think district maps are fair. Certainly, for Republicans in District 2 and Democrats in District 1, votes will not weigh equally. These maps also split 17 high school SAUs and also nine of 10 counties are split. I believe that these maps do not serve Granite Staters well. I ask you to amend, the, amend these maps to draw maps that do. Thank you for your consideration of my testimony. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Bundy? She tries to escape all the time before I ask that question. She comes in front of election, too. <laughs> all right, thank you. Um, also signed up to speak on these bills is Corrine Dodge. Thank you, thank you. I'm having a hard time to quit. You just want to stay. Welcome, good morning. Good morning, Chair Griffin and members. I believe I'm speaking on 240 first, is that correct? You can go, I have every confidence the committee can keep together the difference between the Executive Council and Senate maps, so. I'm you not can go. sure I can is my problem. <laughs> well, that's somewhat true. <clears throat> my name is Corrine Dodge. I'm a voter in Derry, New Hampshire, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify against SB 240 for the proposed Senate redistricting map. I believe that we can all agree that redistricting is a rather time-consuming and expensive process, and that the purpose of redistricting is to even out the number of voters in each district because of population changes during the past 10-year period. Ethically, this process should be done as fairly and as transparently as possible 
to give all voters a chance to be heard. Ideally, a district's population would be evened out by grouping communities of interest like high school SAUs together. This district, this way districts can elect officials who will effectively represent their communities. And that's the most important part, not whether it's SAUs, it's whether they can effectively <clears throat> represent the people that voted in that district. That's the most cr crucial part in my mind. The Minority and Mapathon Independent Citizens Mapping Project proposed maps do a better job of keeping SAUs together <clears throat> and of creating compact districts so that those, those representatives can represent their constituents. These proposals, I'm sorry, these proposals should be considered and I ask you to do so. The purpose of redistricting should not be to silence voters' voices, nor should it be a one-sided political party scramble to assure the election, the re-election of as many incumbent senators from the majority party as possible. And if 50% of New Hampshire voters vote Democrat and 50% vote Republican in the next election, <clears throat> with the maps being considered today, the result would be a consistent 16 to 8 veto-proof majority. <clears throat> if 50% of voters vote for one party and 50 for the other, the Senate should be a 12-12 split, not a gerrymandered 6 to 18 vote. That's what I call gerrymandering, when the results come out consistently 16 to 8 when it's more when it's more likely mathematically to be 12 to 12 split. I ask that you support all New Hampshire voters by amending SB 240, and I thank you. Thank you. Um, should I do them now? Uh, yeah, do them both, and then I'll ask for questions. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot I'm supposed to ask questions. I'm still not used to how this is as a well, this is Well, we're doing this a little different. I know that, I know that, so and I'm very nervous, as I always am, so. You do a terrific job. You should not be nervous. We we know you're always prepared. So welcome and 241. Good morning, Chair Griffin and members. <laughs> Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify. My name is Corrine Dodge, and I am a voter in Derry. I am asking you to vote against SB 241 for the proposed Executive Council map. I have two reasons for this request. One of them has already been stated, is that we haven't had a public hearing on it. And I believe that's important. And it was voted on without that. So I won't go into, in, in, into that any further. I think that's already been stated. I admit that SB 241 clearly changes the look of what I call the gerrymandered 2010 Executive Council map with its dragon <clears throat> District 2 design. However, the partisan intent, intent is still the same, allowing the majority party to gain political power over the opposing party. That's wrong whether who's in charge and who's the opposing party, <clears throat> in my mind. District 2 still collects Democratic leading towns just going up the river instead of across the state. With so many Democratic-leaning towns, Republican voters in District 2 are basically meaningless. And Olivia Zink did a really good job of describing what it feels like to be a voter in a district that you know your vote is not even going to count, so why bother? Sorry. Likewise, District 4 leans Republican, making it hard for Democrats in this district to have their voices heard. Is this what democracy should be about? Protecting political parties over voters. Do away with this funny looking dragon map and voila, the problem of gerrymandered map magically goes away. No, no it doesn't. We all know that. 
What we need is competitive maps where legislators work hard to represent all their constituents, where voters have a fair say in who will represent them, their interests. I urge the committee to amend whatever it is. I forgot that, <laughs> that thing. <laughs> that, that, map. that was the executive council you were talking about. So thank you. See, we were paying attention. We know. Any questions for Ms. Dodge? And you've gotten emails from Ms. Dodge also. Thank you. Thank you. Also signed up to speak on this is Liz Tentarelli. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee for this opportunity to speak. My name is Liz Tenterelli. I'm president of the League of Women Voters of New Hampshire, a nonpartisan organization that's been involved in the fight for fair maps here in New Hampshire since at least 2004. Uh, so we're not newcomers to this. Things don't surprise us. We get very actively involved, but I will say right now, I'm very discouraged. I'm very discouraged by these two maps. Early in this process, the chair of this committee said, it's all about the numbers. And the chair of the Senate committee said, the numbers work out when presenting one of the maps. If that were true, if this were only all about the numbers, I don't think the maps would look this way. Um, we know that on a national level, we congressional, you know, the, the Constitution says we have to do this. Pennsylvania lost a seat, California lost a seat, Texas gained two, and there were some other changes. So we expect changes. But let me talk about the Executive Council map first. Uh, I was very surprised to see that the original proposal that came out of the Special Redistricting Committee was for the same map that we have mocked since 2011 when it was adopted uh, as being obviously gerrymandered with District 2 tortured to become Democrat and the other four strongly leaning Republican. And so I said to a colleague when I heard there might be a change, there might be a, an amendment, I said, well, how much worse can they make it? All right, sorry, I get a little cynical at times. Um, this one is worse. District 2 now is even more strongly Democrat than the District 11, I'm sorry, District 2 that came out of 2011. Five towns with significant size colleges have been crammed into District 2 uh, with their attendant liberal voters and liberal professors and so on. But more than that, District 2 uh, includes the, the uh, town of Hanover, which of course is a college town. It is also the, the hometown of the candidate that held the District 1 Executive Council seat twice in the last 10 years. Not the current incumbent, but somebody who won two elections to hold that seat. That candidate no longer stands a chance in District 1 which he represented for four years because the lines had been drawn. So the idea of uh, what Senator Gray said of protecting incumbents, not protecting exactly, but rather respecting this, we didn't want fights between incumbents, obviously doesn't apply to some people who held the seat well in the past. In my written testimony, I attached a uh, a page at the end, I even paid for color printing, folks. I rarely do this. We are so cheap. Um, this is the results of an NHPR study of the lean of the Senate seats from 1994 through 2014. Um, it doesn't go beyond that because this report came out in 2016. And I am not smart enough mathematically to update this. 
But what you can see in this color chart is that for years, the Senate has won a disproportionate number of seats disproportionate to the overall vote. So if you ignore the efficiency gap for a bit, because I'm not going to try to explain that, just look at the number of seats shown in red for Republican, blue for Democrat, obviously. And within the circle, it shows the percent that the voters got. Um, and we go, it, it's just unbalanced. Uh, so that we have a state where more people are undeclared than Republican or Democrat. But when you look at the overall 2020 election results, you realize that we are still a purple state. The votes tend to go Republic, half Republican, half Democrat. Not so with the Senate seats. And in the new Senate map that has been proposed... An analysis shows that there are now only four competitive seats for the Senate. That it is very likely, even with that evenly split Republican-Democrat vote in the next election, there will be 15 Republican seats out of 24. 15 to 9 is very likely. Um, and I've mentioned some districts in there that are most heavily leaning one way or the other in this Republican map. So when the, the committee chairs say it's all about the numbers, I'm skeptical. I think it's all about the partisan lean. What that means is that voters next fall, if these maps go into effect, will have only one opportunity re to really have their vote count, and that is in the primary. And I don't know that we want that to happen. Typically, we get about a 15% voter turnout in primary elections. People, especially with over 400,000 undeclared voters in the state, they don't pay that much attention to primaries. And yet, these maps predetermine the outcome. Whoever wins the primary in many of these districts whether it's Senate or Executive Council, will win the election. Thank and you. If you could wrap up. I, I am wrapping I up. I figured thank, you were, but thank I'm you, getting people looking, saying, why aren't you saying it? No, no, no. I'm wrapping up. I'm saying as a nonpartisan organization, I want all voters to have their voices heard. And while I can't guarantee everybody will vote in the primary, I want those votes to count in the general election. So I am wrapped up, Ms. Griffin, and thank you for this opportunity. And if there are questions, I would be glad to answer them as long as they don't ex ask me to explain efficiency gap. Questions for Ms. Tenterelli? Thank you for the, for the color print. I'm always impressed by your paper, which is colored, and so it sticks out. Thank Representative you. Lane. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Tenterelli. Um, so how would you define a fair map? A fair map is a map in which all the voters get a chance to elect the candidate of, of their choice in the general election, not just in the primary. That isn't true when you get down to the town level. People live in Democrat or Republican towns. I quite realize that. Um, but by the time we get up to the Senate and the Executive Council districts, and certainly the congressional districts, every vote should be counted, counted and have a fair chance of being counted. That's my idea of fair maps. Follow up. Thank you. Um, is that also consistent with the numbers in order to get the, um, the diverse, not diversity, the equalization of the population? Do you think there's a way to balance that between the two? I, I think it's possible in the executive council maps to have them drawn very differently. I'm not as sure about the Senate maps. I think uh, without torturing things terribly, there might be safe Senate districts for either Republicans or Democrats. Um, but we, we ought to be able to manage it at least for the executive council in, in, in our discussion today. Thank you. Further questions for Ms. Tentarelli? 
Seeing none, thank you very thank much. You. Also signed up to speak on this bill is Sarah Lobe Lobdell. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Some of my my Senate testimony is going around, SB 240 testimony is going around, and then the SB 241 is stapled to another packet, the one that Olivia mentioned with other, a whole bunch of other oh, people. Oh, right, with that I think one we already have. Well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, we don't have that many, so um, if you want to pass out the fair maps, that's fine right now because people have referenced them. Oh, Mapathon. Excuse me. I have fair maps. They're, the signs all say the same. I, I think the they're meeting. fair too. Uh, I could ask some questions about fair, but I'm restraining myself. All right. Uh, w welcome. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Chair Griffin and members of the House Special Committee on Redistricting. Uh, my name is Sarah Lobdell. I'm a voter in Keene, New Hampshire. Um, thank you for taking my testimony. I'm going to speak to SB 240 and 241, um, specifically as they impact Keene and Cheshire County. Um, and I want to start off my SB 240 Senate map testimony with a poem. <clears throat> Roses are red, violets are blue, New Hampshire is purple. These maps should be two. Um, <laughs> so if you look at, I, I included a, a map of the a image of the Senate map in my testimony. Um, and on this map, Keene is in District 10, um, and based on the Mapathon's analysis, District 10 leans heavily Democrat. Um, so this means in District 10 that the, vo the votes and the voices of Republicans and independents um, are outnumbered and essentially meaningless. Um, they won't be able to have a fair shot at electing a candidate that can focus on their needs. Um, furthermore, um, when districts are centered around nonpartisan communities of interest, candidates are also able to better meet our needs as constituents. Um, communities of interest grouped uh, into districts allow constituents to present a united front to their senator to take action on issues that are unique to their communities. Um, so for SB 240, Keene is in District 10 uh, that is crisscrossed across a whole bunch of communities of interest. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Okay. So. Um, lots of towns near Keene are actually split up into different districts in Cheshire County. So I have friends who live in Winchester, which is District 9 on SB 240. Um, they go to work in Keene, they attend school in Keene, they shop in Keene. Um, I would argue that these folks probably have more in common and would be better represented by a senator uh, who represents them in Winchester and Keene at the same time, um, rather than grouping Keene in District 9 and folks in surrounding towns in District 8 or 9. Um, so on SB 240, um, overall message, I urge the committee to please oppose 240 um, and amend the Senate districts to be more competitive and centered around communities of interest like high school SAUs. So thank you for your time on 240. Um, and then uh, 241, my name is Sarah Lobdell. I'm a voter in Keene, New Hampshire. Thank you for taking my testimony. Um, again, I'm going to speak to how SB 241, the executive districts, impact Keene. Um, so again, when districts are competitive, candidates must appeal to a wide range of voters on the issues, um, and candidates are therefore more likely to serve their constituents' needs. So on SB 241, Keene is in District 2, um, with a number of Democrat-leading towns, making it again more likely that a Democrat will be elected, um, and that the votes of Republicans and independents um, will be meaningless as they'll be outnumbered. Um, all voters should have a fair shot at electing candidates that can serve their needs. Uh, so on the back of this testimony, I have the minorities proposal and the Mapathon's proposal for your consideration. Um, the Mapathon's proposal, um, well, both the Mapathon and minority proposal do a better job at making districts competitive, especially where Keene lies. Um, and the last thing I want to say on 241 um, is that I believe I heard Senator Gray earlier say that deviations of around two or less um, is what he was looking for. And so 
um, if you could please consider the Mapathon proposal. The Mapathon's proposal have a population deviation of 2.47, so that's that's pretty close to the, the majority's proposal. Uh, thank you for your time. Please oppose and amend SB 241 to be more competitive. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for that comparison to the uh, Mapathon map. Representative McGee. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for taking my question. Um, as I hear you speak, and you appear to be a, a young voter, <laughs> uh, as I hear you speak about your district and your concerns. Can you define young? <laughs> <laughs> it's like defining woman. I would not go there. No, I, okay. Um, okay. So my question is, uh, when you're talking about competitive districts and you're outlining a concern for uh, disenfranchising certain voters because their vote won't count, if a district is going to swing one way or the other, then you're going to feel like, you know, you voting a different way doesn't really matter. Does that, in your opinion contribute to voter apathy among people who are coming out to vote and turnout in voting? Um, so your question is, if if a district leans heavily one way, do will folks not show up to vote because they think their vote doesn't matter? Is that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I'm not an expert on that, but mm -hmm. I would say my, my hunch as a young voter would be that yes, that folks, um, Often a lot of people that I know don't vote in the primaries because they're like, oh, the people who really care about these issues will vote and then we'll vote later in the general. And so then in the general, um, if you feel like you're going to show up, but the other candidate already, you're already outnumbered in terms of voters for the other candidate, people, yeah, might not show up. And follow the, up. The other, continu the other uh, con contributing issue that I can see that I would ask you about is, um, is whether a safe district also contributes to um, not having the elected person be responsible to the voters. Um, so if, yeah, if a district is safe, will the um, the senator or executive council not be responsive to all voters? Um, that's, yeah, definitely potential. If they feel like they only need to focus on like one tiny chunk of their constituents and meet their needs, and maybe that's like, the biggest city in their really sprawly district, they, yeah, they might not focus on all of the other constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from committee members? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Also signed up to speak on both the bills we're considering this morning is Frank Karnak, Karak? Welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Frank Kinnock. I'm the policy director with the ACLU of New Hampshire, um, and we are here in opposition to both uh, SB 240 and SB 241. Um, starting with SB 240, so we wanted to make sure that we could provide um, an independent data-driven analysis of, of the map in the Senate uh, proposal. And so consult and contracted with an outside firm to provide that independent analysis. And we can conclude from their analysis uh, that this is in fact a partisan gerrymander. Um, many of the points I wanted to discuss have already been uh, lifted up, but I'll just point out a few things in addition. Um, from the findings, uh, we can conclude that uh, the partisan lead for uh, Democratic leaning districts is plus 9.11. The partisan lean for uh, GOP leaning districts is point uh, five point oh four, so a substantial uh, difference there. And I also think it's important to note um, the 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 um, the scope or the size of the partisan lean is is much much greater for Democratic leaning districts than for Republican leaning districts. So in terms of their their packing ability was substantial on Democrats. Um, I'll point out that in four, there was only four districts where it was above 10 points. All four of those were Democratic leaning districts. And in two of those, it was not only above 10 points, it was actually 19, ab above 19 points. Um, and also point out the highest Republican PAC district was only 9.4, so more than double. Um, so I think it's important um, that voters pick um, their politicians and not the other way around. And with the Senate map, uh, the Senate map fails to meet that basic test. 
on the um, on the executive council, we are because there's a new proposal that was that's been brought. We are still having that analysis conducted. Uh, so I can just speak to the preliminary findings that we have, which is that I think has been as alluded to. Uh, we have serious concerns, particularly with District 2 um, and any extreme packing there. And I also think it's important to recognize um, from reports that um, it is our understanding that executive council members actually asked for this. And so I think you can't get a better example in that case of politicians picking their voters and not the other way around. Uh, so um, and I will be circulating the additional analysis as soon as we get it back um, to the full committee so that you all have it in front of you, as well as the, uh, the original analysis that I mentioned. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Before I recognize committee members, you mentioned that you retained a firm to do the analysis. You, do you have anything in writing today for us for that analysis? Yes, I'll be circulating. So um, it was Flow Analytics. Um, and the reason I did not provide before the hearing is uh, we're still waiting for the updated executive council. And so I wanted to make sure I could send them together to the okay. full committee. All right. And so Flow Analytics is the firm that you retained? Yes. And when did the Senate pass the Senate and the Executive Council maps? Do you recall that date? Uh, I believe it was the end of January, around the end of January, early February. I don't think that's right. I'm just going to look to Olivia. Do you know have the date? All right, Olivia. 15th when you have of the, February, maybe. But if yeah. you could let me know the dates they were actually approved by the Senate, that would be terrific. All right, questions from committee members. Representative Lane. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, since we are probably going to vote on these today, could you please provide us with the information as soon as possible? Absolutely. Perhaps before the end of this hearing uh, so I that can... we can have the advantage of looking at it. You can just email it to the Election Law Committee through the website if you've got anything online, if you don't have copies. Excuse okay. me. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, Representative Lane. Will we have time to review that before yes, we Yes, we're going to have a break. Okay. Yeah, so I will, I will send the Senate version. Um, the, it includes the Senate and the Executive Council. The Executive Council maps have been changed since this analysis. I understand, but at so least we'd have... So I'll send you the Senate version, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from committee members? Seeing none, thanks for joining us this Thank morning. you so much. Also signed up to speak on this is David Erickson. David Erickson from Ware, New Hampshire. Um, not being experienced at testifying, I only brought one copy. Should I give it to you, Representative you can, Griffin? Do you need it to testify from? And then you can give it, it to help. Representative it Roulard help. after you're done. Would that help? Okay, yes, sure. It would. Thank you, Representative Griffin and Senators. Um, We're all representatives here. A senator has left the room. The senator left the room. Um, I didn't intend to testify, but I was so outraged by Senator Gray's testimony that he could assert that he was um, just trying to count to 13. I think he counted to 15 at least. Um, so I, um, I'll testify first on Senate Bill 241, which I do ask you all to vote against. Um, I live in Ware. Uh, I've taught in the Ware School District and also in the Henniker School District. And I would like a senator who would be familiar with the school districts and care about their interests. And so having them in the same district makes sense to me. Um, what do I, as a resident of Ware, and my neighbors and friends in Dunbarton have in common with those communities way over on the Connecticut River? Um, not much. Um, and many Republican friends of mine in Ware, um, I feel, would be uh, disenfranchised by the district proposed um, because uh, there's no real point in voting um, for each individual with it being such a certain thing that um, the Republican candidate would win. I also wonder if Ruth Ward would really 
want to have to travel that distance in representing her district. Um, at our town election um, on the warrant was the uh, fair maps proposal and overwhelmingly we voted for it. Um, can this committee reasonably assert that the proposed Senate district maps comply with fair criteria? I don't think so. As for SB 241, uh, I was working with others in the town to put together a candidate's night, and we hope to include executive council candidates, Dave Wheeler and Deborah Pignatelli at the time. And when I called Deborah Pignatelli, she said, I'd love to come, but I really have to focus on Nashua. That's where I you know, get the greatest bang for the buck. I'm not going to um, gain enough votes in where to make it worth my while to come up. That was very dismaying to me. It seems that if districts were more balanced, then those few votes that she could get in the rural parts of, of that executive council district, and this was, of course, the old map, um, would have been more likely to see her get to know her um, and for her to get to know them. So um, it's a shame that for expediency, she felt the need to focus on Nashua pretty much to the exclusion of rural communities. So please vote against these gerrymandered maps and give us a, a fair shot and uh, make it so that we're all fairly represented. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Erickson? Um, Mr. Erickson, with, if you're willing, Representative Weber has a question for you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Uh, following on to your comments of concern about the rural district, as I represent a rural district myself, uh, would you agree with me that the uh, council maps that, as drawn that we would be voting on today do an extreme disservice to North Country voters because uh, both uh, one and two also contain large population centers and therefore uh, those may be the focus of candidates to the exclusion of the entire North Country as the maps are drawn. From my limited experience down in District 5, I would be afraid that would be the same situation. Thank you, sir. Further questions for Mr. Erickson? Seeing none, thank you very much for coming, Mr. Erickson. And we have your written testimony for the record. Um, the last person I have signed up for this, um, if there's anybody else who wanted to speak, they need to do a pink card, is David Andrews. I, I never know whether to have Mr. Andrews come first with the Mapathon or, or last, but everybody seemed to know the work you've done, so I thought I would let you go last so you could go through everything before we break. Welcome. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for the record, my name is David Andrews. I'm from Chichester. Um, I was the lead mapper on the Mapathon project. Um, Redistricting is one of the most important things that will be undertaken by this body and by the legislature in New Hampshire. It lasts for 10 years, so eight-year-olds now will be voting on these maps. And the vote that you're about to take is probably going to be the most important one that you make as legislatures. With redistricting, you can choose who you want to have as your um, representatives, or you can let the voters choose. In that, it's a lot easier to move one town on a map than it is to swing an electorate by percentage points. You know, it's much easier to pack your opponents into districts than it is to win over 
their voters who um, usually vote for them. Um, there's been a lot of talk today about fair maps and what makes a fair map. And it's been difficult for a lot of people um, to define this, both Senator Gray and others, because we don't have criteria. Neither this committee nor its counterpart in the Senate released criteria. If you have criteria, you can look at that and judge maps against each other. We've talked about how there's thousands of maps that can be created, but each are not equal. And if you have criteria, you can rank them against each other based on that criteria, whether it's population, competitiveness, compactness, um, communities of interest, any of those things. You can then rank those maps and throw out the ones that don't come close on any of those metrics that you decide to use. What we did in the Mapathon project was we went out to the voters, to cons the residents of New Hampshire, and asked, what are important to you? And that's what we got. We got a list of, you know, 63 things that Senator Gray talked about that were important to, to people. Then we went back and asked people, what, what's most important to you? You know, and we got high school SAUs, um, local hospitals, uh, public health regions, county lines. Those things were the most important things to the residents of New Hampshire. And thus, we went forward and mapped according to those uh, criteria. We didn't take competitiveness into account until afterwards. I drew hundreds of maps and never did I, well, never did I use competitiveness as a metric when I was drawing a map that I wanted to put forward. I did draw gerrymanders on either side for fun, um, specifically for the executive council map. And remarkably, the one that is put forth today looks remarkably similar to the Republican gerrymander that I drew probably five days after the 2020 census was released. So what I would do would, I would draw according to the criteria and then afterwards I would look and see if the competitiveness looked reasonable. You know, New Hampshire being a 50-50 state, you would expect, you know, 12-12 or 13-11, something like that in the, in the Senate districts. So that's what I would do. I would, I would go use the criteria, figure out what um, a map that met most of the criteria and then look and see if it was um, competitiveness, competitive or not. Um, and that's what I think should be done and should be the process going forward um, for this body. Um, the 2010 Senate map, now getting into uh, the, the Senate map, the 2010 Senate map was already pretty uh, partisanly swung. Um, you know, it's been stated 50-50 in 2020 and it was a 14-10 split. This currently proposed map goes even further when it doesn't need to. Senator Gray talked about how um, the population changed, so, so we needed to make significant changes to the 2010 map. It's just not true. Yes, we needed to make some changes. If you put the 2010 map uh, with the 2020 census, you get a deviation of 13.47%, um, which is higher than the 10% generally allowed by courts. By moving 10 towns, you can get that deviation to lower than the 7.5% that they got. 10 towns, most of which are in the, the North Country, um, swinging uh, District 1 and 2 around a little bit, gets you most of the way there. One of the most egregious uh, displays of gerrymandering is in this current proposal is District 9 and 10. They needed to be balanced. There was there was more people in District 9 than District 10, and thus something needed to be done. Okay. All you needed to do was move Richmond from District 9 to District 10, and it balanced out those populations. That's it. But instead, they moved Peterborough and Hancock into District 10, which are Democrat-leaning towns, thus packing more Democrats into District 10, and swung District 9 all the way from Bedford to Hinsdale, 72 miles. It takes over two hours to drive it. And in doing so, created a new, more Republican-lean district rather than the 
very competitive district. District 9 had been in the last six to eight years. Um, this the the least changed map of just 10 towns would have um, moved zero incumbents out of their districts instead of the the 20 or instead of the two that were moved so if it was about um, if it was about protecting incumbents this would have done that if it was about getting the lowest population deviation this would have done it so I I can go through and talk about every single little change. I'm not going to that the map that was made on this Senate map, and each one of them is made to give a partisan advantage to the majority party. Um, moving on to the Executive Council map, uh, again, the 2010 map was already gerrymandered and very clearly gerrymandered. Um, with the Dragon District. And yes, this may look a little bit better, but in a partisan a partisan in a partisan sense, it is even worse than the, the old map. Um, it moves 4.2 percent more Democrats into District 2, thus packing Democrats, and then uh, which leads to, District 4 becoming about 1% more Republican, District 5 becoming 1.6% more Republican, um, and District 1 becoming 4.2% more Republican. So it's very clear to me um, what was being done in these maps. Um, instead of District 2 kind of being a keen conquered Dover district, they made it a keen conquered um, and then like Hanover and up into Northern Grafton to grab Democrats up there rather than going all the way across the state. Um, it may look better, but it's definitely not better. It breaks up nine of the 10 counties when it really doesn't need to at all. Um, you know, if we had criteria, we could better define a better map. But since we don't have any criteria, people can say that, you know, this is the best that we could do, but it, it's clearly not. Um, I hope that you will uh, amend both of these uh, bills with uh, maps that are fair in that they are more competitive, more compact, um, keep more communities of interest together. Um, and I hope that you will, will look at the, the Mapathon proposals. Um, and I would be happy to, you know, help out in any way that I can, including answering any questions you have now. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Andrews, why don't you just go through the handout real quickly with us, because I was bouncing around as you were you were uh, testifying. Um, and I believe this has been online now in, in part or in whole for a few days, but online for a little bit. Um, you go through in the first page and talk about um, the document and a little bit of the history. Um, and for members who might be wa watching, I, I'm sort of flying through this because uh, Mr. Andrews and this committee are familiar with each other from before in the Mapathon work. So um, I'm doing this just so when we break here, people have looked at it so we know what we have. Um, you also have provided a, a glossary of terms. Um, you have listed in the communities of interest definitions um, that you had. Were those the primary uh, ones that you use? It doesn't appear to be all of them, but uh, you, you listed a few. If you could just uh, clarify that, because you talked about the gross number that you began with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We started out with, I believe it was 63 yeah. on a list of everyone, and uh, we kind of whittled down to, to five. Um, all right. I don't ones. believe there are five listed in your definition. What were the five? Um, they were high school districts, shared water systems, shared uh, police and fire, uh, in addition to hospitals, and um, we. There was a number of different communities of interest that people talked about with concern to, um, like PFAS and kind of general um, health and community well-being issues, uh, drug use, those kind of things that we kind of. Put together and used i forget the exact um the yeah the public health um metric that is released by the um the, by the census bureau has a chart of um the general so high schools water districts shared police and fire hospitals and public health yep 
Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, I, yeah, and we, we included... Um, I, I'm asking Mr. Andrews oh, as chair of the committee for the benefit of the, the, the committee looking at this because the five communities of interest that he mentioned were primary or do not appear to be listed anywhere in this document. So I am asking him what they are. He could only remember four. Olivia Zink clarified that public health was the fifth. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Then you had some. You have some conclusions on the executive council proposals, and then you have um, three maps on, I guess, page five, and you talk about the minority, majority, and mapathon. What is the minority and the majority proposal? What does that mean? Um, the majority proposal is the current um, map that's in the in the bill that passed the the Senate. Um, the minority proposal was proposed um, in the Senate. In the Senate. Okay, so that was a, a Senate um, bill proposed. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. Um, and then you have on the next page six communities of interest which are labeled. Um, and then I believe the next page you've clearly labeled a 2010 current map with, of course, the District 2, which we heard a lot about for 10 years. Um, and then the next page we have, again, this is what you're referring to as the majority proposal um, currently that we currently have before us, correct? Yes. Okay. And then the minority proposal, was that another one brought in front of the Senate? Yep, that's the, that's the same map. It's just... Okay. And then that you have your mapathon proposal. All right, and then you wrap up with some some comments. Great. I just wanted to go through that to make sure I understood what I was looking at. Questions from the committee for Mr. Andrews. Representative Weber. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair, for having us go through that because it allows me to look at the actual picture of the 2010 Executive Council maps, and we all heard a lot about the Dragon District and those of us who were there, which is just me, the last time we did this, uh, certainly yelled about that a great deal at that time. But what is bewildering me and what I'd like you to comment on is that uh, not only the sponsor of the current map, but, but you as well said that this map looks better than what we have now, and to my eye, um, yes, there is one peculiar district here, and here we have three exceedingly peculiar districts. So in what way does this look better than what we have now? Can I interject? It looks fairer. Um, why don't you go ahead and answer the question? Um, yeah, so Madam Chair, I really object to that. I'm um, to, to, go to, to um, answer that. One way that is actually generally accepted in um, in courts and other uh, ways in in redistricting is whether a district is visually compact. Um, and I would agree that you know definitely two and five in, in this newly proposed map are not visually compact. Um, you could argue that district one is kind of, um, but generally if you, if you look at a map and you say, you know, whether it, it, it looks compact or not is, um, I I would I would argue that you're you're correct in that this one does look look funky. You have the kind of tendrils that reach out and grab you know Peterborough and Concord and then up into to Grafton. But um, the old map was very well defined as you know the Dragon District and it was you know well known in that regard. So it 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 kind of uh, jumps out as being the you know the example of gerrymandering in the last ten years and thus. Um, that's why I, I clarified that that was, you know, looked worse, probably. Follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for taking my follow up. Um, and, and 
now stepping away from the shapes and considering what is uh, underlying the maps, uh, would you agree with me that uh, what we have done in changing from the old map to the new map is that we have significantly uh, disadvantaged pretty much everything north of Concord in terms of having their own, having, having a representative who both lives in, in the heart of their district and having a district that is, uh, that has a completely diffused population, uh, a district composed of small towns, small cities, and, and even smaller towns, uh, rather than being connected to significant population centers, which share even less with the very rural districts. Yeah, I think that especially with the executive council map, you can think of it as um, almost regionally. Um, for instance, like when I would would draw executive council maps, I would I would think, you know, all right, five districts or what kind of five regions of New Hampshire are there? You know, north of Concord, uh, Keene, um, you know, Nashua, Manchester. Uh, seacoast. Those are kind of the five that I, you know, think about in my in my head. Um, and so that's what how I would kind of draw it out, because I would think, you know, a lot of the towns north of Concord have a lot much more in common with each other than do towns kind of south of New Hampshire. So, um, yeah, I agree that it will definitely, um, it, it could lead to less kind of representation in in the north country you know if you get a um a rep a executive counselor out of dover and you get one out of keen um the north country it, it's going to be both difficult for them to travel up there and also um for them to have a kind of sense of community and really know what the residents of those districts really want from their uh counselor thank you Further questions? I'm not seeing any. Thank you, Mr. Andrews, for Thanks. being here again and, and staying with this project. Um, I would like Excuse to point me. out. Excuse sorry. Me. Oh, did you have a question? I'm sorry, I missed it. Did he go through this one? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Asleep at the switch. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I don't have anybody else. I don't have any other pink cards. Before I close the public hearing, you all have received the email um, from the ACLU in regards to um, the survey or analysis that they had done. I'm trying to download the link on my phone, uh, but you have the email with the link presented in it. Um, and Ms. Zink was very helpful and provided me with the information on when things passed. SB 241 uh, passed with the amendment to create the bill we considered today on March 24th out of the Senate, and SB 240 passed out of the Senate on February 16th. So with that, this committee is going to recess. Um, we will be back here at 1 o'clock to open executive session on these bills. Thank you.
All right, good afternoon, everybody. It is a few minutes after 1 o'clock. We had some technical difficulties that look like they've been resolved. We are live streaming and being recorded now. Um, as I announced before we broke about an hour and 20 minutes ago, we are going to have an executive session on the bills we just heard. The notice in the calendar was appropriate. Um, and we're going to go forward this afternoon with SB 240 and SB 241. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask if there's a motion on SB 240. Representative McGuire. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move off to pass. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Representative Lynn seconds it. Representative McGuire, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, Madam Chair. Senate Bill 240 is the state Senate districts as devised by the state Senate. They meet all legal and constitutional requirements. The districts are contiguous. The populations are equal within appropriate limits. And therefore, I believe that, that since we verified that they meet all requirements, we should support the, our colleagues in the Senate and vote for it. Thank you, Representative McGuire. Further discussion on the motion? Representative Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, while I agree with my colleagues that we should be very deferential to the wishes of the Senate in dealing just as we hope that they are deferential to us in the uh, redistricting of the House, I have to point out that the map that we have been sent has significant defects in it. And one of the things that we heard again and again when we had joint hearings on other issues, but it can't be any different for the Senate districts, is that our constituents wanted districts that were compact and competitive. And this map provides neither. We have uh, a number of districts, first of all, that have been um, the, the partisan divide in the districts has, has increased enormously. So uh, 15 of the di districts are demonstrably now more Republican-leaning, and um, the Democratic districts have been packed so that their partisan lean is far, far greater than that of the Republican districts. So that concerns me for, for item number one. Item number two, which is that um, communities of interest have been unnecessarily split in forming these maps. You have the most obvious issue is in District 9, which now stretches from the Connecticut River some 70 miles, some of which are not really following the way the roads go, uh, all the way over to the outskirts of Manchester. Uh, there are, are no interests in common in that district. And uh, speaking from the Cheshire County perspective, the Cheshire County part of that map is significantly disadvantaged by being outweighed by the population being on the other side of it. Um, District 10, which used to be entirely in Cheshire County, which made a great deal of sense, now includes a couple of Hillsborough County towns, whereas Cheshire County, which is a small county, has been added to parts of four different senatorial districts. Uh, we have, uh, uh, with respect to the cities, um, Nashua has been split up, and Nashua this remains split up, but some of some of the District 12 goes all the way to Ringe and Cheshire County. Uh, Manchester has been split up between three different senatorial districts, and Ward 1 has been connected to Candia, Goffstown, Hookset, and Raymond, again, ignoring communities of interest. Um, and so I am concerned that this map has uh, really been drawn to preserve the interests of incumbents to the detriment of creating competitive districts. And so that's my concern about it and why I won't be voting for it. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments? 
Representative Lane. Thank you, Madam Chair. While I agree um, with the Representative um, McGuire that it meets the legal requirements, I think we should strive for more than the bare legal requirements. We represent all of our constituents, not just those that are of our party, and we owe them a duty to give them the best maps possible, and I do not think that the maps that were proposed and passed in the Senate are those maps. And I would like to say that if we're truly concerned about election integrity, the way we talk about it on the Election Law Committee, then we need to focus more than just on the security of elections, but we also need to let voters know that they are going to go into the ballot box and at the vote, sorry, the voting booth and have a real choice and that their choice is going to matter. And under these maps, for many people in New Hampshire, that is not going to be the case. And I think we could do a better job, and I had hoped that we would have done a better job. And for that reason and others, I will not be voting for this map. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments? Seeing none, I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. The motion on the floor is OTP SB 240. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Representative Stephen Smith. Yes. Representative Carol McGuire. Yes. Representative Turcott. Yes. Uh, Representative McDonald votes yes. Representative Lynn. Yes. Representative Berry. Yes. Representative Roulard. Um, Representative Bergeron. No. Representative Lane. No. Representative Piedra. No. Representative Weber. No. Representative Wilhelm. No. <clears throat> Representative Long. No. Representative McGee. No. Representative Griffin. Yes. Seven, eight to seven. The motion carries SB 240 will be reported to the House as ought to pass. The other bill before this committee to consider today is SB 241. Um, it is uh, open to motion. Representative Bergeron. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move to amend Senate Bill 241 with amendment number 2022-1543H, and I request to uh, speak to that amendment. Is there a second? Representative Weber seconds it. Representative Bergeron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, let me first anticipate probably one of the first questions I will get after I, I speak, so I, I won't have to answer it later. Uh, and this was unexpected. The Mapathon handout that uh, was distributed during the public hearing relative to the Executive Council map references a uh, minority proposal and, and provides some data regarding that minority proposal. That is the proposal that was submitted by the minority in the Senate, and it is the proposal that's before you today with the amendment that I just cited. Um, I began, during the public hearing, I think I only asked one question, and it was asked of Senator Gray regarding this bill. Um, why didn't they just keep the existing districts the way they were? Because uh, the population fell well within the acceptable range of deviation. Uh, and his answer was, um, given the public testimony we heard uh, and the shape of Executive Council District 2, and he was re he very adroitly uh, avoided using the word gerrymandered district, um, but I'm going to use it. Uh, but he said that was the reason for trying to redraw the map. Uh, unfortunately, or or not, uh, the Senate plan kind of hacked away the western portion of District 1, south of Carroll and west of Lincoln, and moved that into District 2. Uh, District 5 has kind of a funny shape, almost like an alligator taking a, a bite out of proposed District 2 under Senate Bill 241. So now instead of having one oddly shaped Executive Council district, we have three. The amendment that's before you uh, proposes that uh, uh, District 1 would run south. Uh, I'm sorry. Geographically, District 1 would remain a large district that encompasses the northern part of the state. It's not split in half uh, as proposed by Senate Bill 241. 
uh, the districts that we're proposing in the minority proposal try and keep counties intact within the councilor districts as much as possible. And in District 1, it incorporates five entire counties, Coos, Carroll, Grafton, Belknap, and Sullivan, rather than a district uh, that's proposed that has seven different counties or pieces of them in that district. District 2, which was terribly gerrymandered uh, currently and in the proposed Senate plan, uh, would become a much more compact district under the minority proposal. It would include Merrimack and Stafford counties in the northwestern part of Rockingham County. District 3 remains similar to the existing district, but uh, places Candia and Hudson in the district and moves Derry into District 4 to balance some population shifts. District 4 becomes more compact. The only town in the proposed district that does not share a border with Manchester is Derry and District 5 would now encompass the entirety of Cheshire County and the vast majority of Hillsborough County, including Nashua. That's the uh, major differences between uh, what's being proposed in this amendment and what's before us in Senate Bill 241, and I would uh, um, appreciate your support for the amendment. Thank you, Representative Bergeron. Further uh, comments on the amendment before us, which is 2022? 1543, Representative McGee. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I just noticed in looking at the Mapathon breakdown that a, uh, another comparison chart here um, lists that the high school SAU splits under the current Senate proposal uh, come out to 17 SAUs that are split, uh, their districts are split, and the Mapathon version is, is three. So it's an improvement there for something that I know folks were coming out uh, to the hearings and asking for that there be some regard given for those. So there's a pr preference there. Um, and also the county splits, which we discussed in earlier testimony, uh, are about half. So the Senate proposal has nine county splits and the Mapathon version uh, has five. So just for your consideration. Excuse me, Madam Chair. Representative McGuire. She's talking about the Mapathon proposal. Isn't this the Senate minority proposal for instead? Uh, that is correct. Yes, and I, I believe that the uh, amendment sponsor mentioned that that they, it was the same. Thank you. I wasn't aware of that. If, if I may, Madam it, Chair. If, if, if you can explain, because it is presented in the Mapathon work as a minority proposal. Ah. Yes, the uh, the minority proposal uh, is not the Mapathon proposal, oh, it's not. but it's analyzed in the Mapathon report. Thank you. Thank you. Further comment on the amendment before the committee, which is 2022-1543 in regards to the Executive Council maps. I'm seeing none, so I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Representative Stephen Smith. No. Representative McGuire. No. Representative Turcott. No. Representative McDonald votes no. Representative Lynn. No. Representative Barry. No. Representative Rouillard. Representative um, Bergeron. Yes. Representative Lane. Yes. Representative Piedra. Yes. Representative Weber. Representative Wilhelm. Yes. Representative Long. Yes. Representative McGee. Yes. Representative Griffin. No. Seven to eight, Madam Chairman. The amendment fails. Uh, we have SB 241. In front of us, are there any further amendments on SB 241? Representative Bergeron, did you want to bring something forward? Uh, no, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, SB 241 is before us. Um, I'm not seeing anybody indicating they have an amendment. Does anybody have a motion to make? Representative Turcott. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move SB 241 as amended by the Senate ought to pass. Second. It's been seconded by Representative Lynn. On the floor in front of the committee for vote is SB 241 OTP. Is there any 
Discussion on the motion, Representative Turcott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, SB 241, as amended by the Senate, is uh, updates the Executive Council councilor maps uh, based on the most current uh, census data. It uh, ends up with a deviation just slightly higher than 1%. Uh, it removes the old District 2, which there is much consternation over. And lastly, it does meet all constitutional and legal requirements. Thank you, Madam Chair. Further discussion on the motion before the floor, which is OTP SB 241. I'm Representative Lane. Well, if nobody else is, uh, so, um, while I agree that it replaces the old district number two, which is a dragon or a snake, depending on how you want to call it, it actually is, ends up with a worse result and is, is more gerrymandered than the one that was put forth in 2010 and adopted in 2011. And not to sound like a broken record, but I will repeat what I said last time, that we should strive for more than the bare legal requirements. We represent all our voters. I represent the Republican voters in my district. Even though I'm a Democrat, I still represent them and vote for their best interest. And I think that if you are concerned about election integrity, you want people to have faith in our entire election process, and that includes the redistricting process. And with this map and the other maps, you are discouraging people in lopsided districts to not participate in the vote voting process. And I would suggest that that does more harm to election integrity than some of the security measures that we've been putting forth in the election law committee. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lane. Further comment on the motion? The motion on the floor is OTP SB 241. Seeing none, I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Representative Stephen Smith. Yes. Representative McGuire. Yes. Representative Turcott. Yes. Representative McDonald votes yes. Representative Lynn. Yes. Representative Barry. Yes. Representative Rouillard. Representative Bergeron. No. Representative Lane. No. Representative Piedra. No. Representative Weber. Representative Wilhelm. No. Representative Long. No. Representative McGee. No. Representative Griffin. Yes. Eight to seven, Madam Chairman. SB 241 will be reported as ought to pass. I understand the minority report would be ITL with a minority amendment. Um, ought to pass with it. And that has been report will be reported. Um, is there any further business in regards to these items, 240 and 241? All right. Um, we will be having a meeting next Friday. I haven't looked at my email to see if Lindsay where the email or notice uh, status is, but we will be having a meeting next Friday um, to consider a non-germane amendment to SB 200, which will be a vehicle used by this committee uh, to consider congressional district maps. So, um, you has, should- Has, Madam Chair? Yes, Representative. I, we, did, we did receive the notice and it said the proposed amendment was on the website. Has it actually been posted on the website, do you know? I don't know, I haven't looked. I'll look now, though. Um, the actual amendment will be um, is supposed to be posted and the amendment itself will be in the calendar, but as with all the other amendments I've discussed that I want it on the website, so we'll see what we can get done. All right, with that, thank you very much everybody for coming today and we'll see you next Friday. Keep a lookout on the notice to find out what room we're in.